morning, everyone, and welcome to the FSB national webinar on what is ESG and how to tackle your ESG strategy. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. My name is Frederica Andres. I am the policy advisor at FSB for environment, energy and transport, and also today's moderator. We are joined today by an amazing panel. We have with us Muriel Boulet, who is the CEO of The Otherwise. After 20 years in the food industry, uh, working for the UK's household food brands, Muriel created The Otherwise to guide businesses on their journey towards more sustainability. We also have with us Maria Kearns, who's the Managing Director for Customer and People at the Cooperative Bank. Maria joined the bank in 2002 and has held a number of senior management roles across the bank during that time. Her role is focused on how the bank supports and works for its customers and colleagues. Also from the Cooperative Bank, we have Catherine Douglas, who is the Managing Director for SMU Banking at the bank. Catherine joined the bank in October 2020 with over 20 years experience in businesses uh, in business banking. Catherine is responsible for delivering the Cooperative Bank's digital transformation plans and improving our ethical banking proposition and services for businesses. And finally, we have with us uh, Sat Pillai, who's the founder of Circled Up. Um, Circle Up measures and maximizes the effectiveness of sustainability initiatives focusing on strategic collaboration. Set is also serves as the chair of the Environment Policy Unit at the Federation of Small Businesses. Um, each speaker will deliver a short presentation before we open to questions. Please use the questions to panelists button to send over your questions and we will endeavor to answer as many as possible. Feel free to add questions during the presentations as well. Today's session will also be recorded and shortly available on our on-demand page on the FSB website in case you really want to watch it again. And finally, if you aren't an FSB member yet, we'd love to have the opportunity uh, to speak to you further about the benefits of joining. So please do visit our website to book a meeting with the membership advisor. And now, without further ado, we'll welcome Muriel, um, who will explain in more detail what ESG is and why it matters to you. Muriel, thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick, and good morning, everybody. So um, it's a pleasure, actually, to, to open this chat about a subject that is absolutely dear to my heart and very, very topical. Um, during the week where the latest IPCC report was released um, about the mitigation for climate change. So I hope you're all aware of it. Um, and when it comes to, to ESG, um, what, what's the link? So first of all, ESG stands for Environment, Society and Governance. And it's about the framework that um, was first developed by financial institutions to assess how their um, portfolio of investment was performing in terms of people and planet. So there are various standards, there are various measures to, um, to assess the impact, impact being the critical word here, on, on people and planet. It includes things like... Um, social uh, responsibility, corporate social responsibility that has been around for quite a while and sustainability, which I'm sure you've um, you've heard about. Um, when it comes to um, what, what it means for, for businesses, it's about rethinking the way you, you do business, the way you operate and generate profit, not only to, um, you know, for the long term future of, of your business, but to mitigate risk and um, as the report highlight, um, it, it's about mitigating risk and um, regenerate, having a positive impact. What we need to bear in mind, and that's really the context of ESG, it's this um, boundaries. You, you might have heard in the press the concept of social boundaries, human boundaries, um, nature boundaries, and, and the fact that um, businesses and, and people in general each year we use up all the resources, um, you know, for a year 
way before the calendar year ends. So it's about respecting these boundaries and, and really helping both the environment and society to thrive through your business activity. So that's a very broad overview of what um, ESG is. And you might wonder what the benefits are for your business, if I can. And, and it's really, first of all, um, a way to, like I said, to ensure the, the long-term uh, future of your business. It's about resilience. We all in the midst um, and following the news on, on the Ukraine uh, war and how it affects everything, society and, and ultimately environment. And it's about understanding how you can um, build resilience in your business through sustainability, through ESG, uh, to make sure that you, you are prepared uh, to face these types of crises, which I'm afraid are probably not here to, they, they're here for, for the long term. There's also the fact that ESG uh, makes good business sense in the sense that if we look just at energy, for example, should you make um, a lot of effort to, re to reduce your energy consumption, you will reduce your operational costs. So there's there's something here that you know it's about efficiency, it's about good business sense. It's also about brand reputation and customer loyalty. There's more and more customers and consumers that are um, have decided to vote with their wallet. Um, they want to sponsor, they want to uh, support brands and businesses that share their value, um, their values when it comes to uh, people and planet. And they will go the extra way um, to, to support these, these businesses. So you would have um, heard maybe about um, the um, B Corp month that and, ended um, at the end of last week, which highlighted that there's, a, there's more and more awareness, um, at least at consumer level, on you know, these businesses that have committed to um, support system change and really... Um, treat fairly the employees, um, taking care of the environment and making sure that they, um, they lead their business in a transparent um, and ethical way. There's also um, what I've called the right to play. Right to play meaning that you, you um, need to display your commitments and your impact when it comes to um, interacting with potential customers. You know, for example, the public sector is um, when you tender for, for a project, you have to demonstrate um, your, for lack of a better word, for your CSR uh, credential. Um, and that actually counts for up to 30% of the, your rating in a tender. So more and more, it becomes something that a must have, not the high, nice to have. So this ESG sustainability strategy is really becoming your right to be at the table. Um, it's also translating into your ability to access capital and investors should you want to uh, push for more growth in your business. And finally, and it's hugely topical for the moment with, you know, you, you might have heard the, um, the term great resignation um, at the end of last year where people are really reconsidering, you know, what they want to do with their life and who they want to work for. Um, having a strong ESG strategy really helps you to attract the right people and to retain the, the, the good ones that you have. So it's, um, it's, it's quite wide um, scope in terms of benefit. And um, if, if you know, your thing is not about saving the planet, then maybe saving your business is the right thing and you'll find something that resonates with you in this list. So what we're gonna do now is look at um, each of, of the letters. So um, E for environment, um, the, the key thing for environment is we, we've been as a human race using a lot of resources on this planet um, without thinking about the fact that we couldn't replenish them. So the, 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 key, the key word that I'm gonna use here is reduce. Um, there's another word that is, um, is being used is, is refuse which is, you know, refuse to purchase something that you don't, you don't need, refuse to purchase um, a huge cardboard box when you only need the, you know, the little product in the middle of it. 
um, reduce reduce your energy. We've just um, talked about you know making business sense to to lower your consumption. Water is also a very precious re um, resource that we don't talk about enough. I think it's uh, optimizing your processes and and it's really working with your supply chain to to look at what you consume is uh, what you're using to to um, provide your services or your goods and how to optimize um, consumption of that resource. Everybody's talking about net zero for the moment, um, and on purpose, it's not at the top of my slide, even though it's critical, um, and we, did, we do need to work collectively towards um, minimizing the temperature um, increase around the globe. Um, it is part of a, a set of actions that contributes to maintaining um, the planet in a hospitable um, state for all species. So when I say we are a frog in the pan is every, you know, um, every little bit of a degree additional that we put on this average temperature will have consequences on, on the climate, on, you know, ecosystems, etc. So we really need to work really hard to minimize that increase. And then finally, what is important for environment is regenerate. Um, I don't know if you like me, I've heard about this um, save, um, save Soil campaign that is being led by um, an Indian guru called Sad Guru. He's going around the world on his motorbike, stopping in all the capitals and talking to people about the importance of soil and um, telling people that we are soil. Without soil, we, don't, we are not. Um, so it, I would encourage you to, to look at how you can regenerate, um, you know, working with your local council, your local farmers, um, protecting forests, supporting um, activities that regenerate hedgerows, etc. It's at your doorstep. You just need to look for it. Um, and then the, the underlying uh, note on this is really that... Um, the more you, you um, pursue the regeneration of the environment, the happier people will be around you because the better in the, the, the nature is, the more we, we need to remember that we are part of nature. And therefore, you know, um, we've talked a lot about people well-being and I believe that a nature in a good state will contribute to people well-being. So if we go to the social aspect of it, which stands for the yes, S is stakeholders, S is society, S is suppliers, um, and I will start looking for other words uh, starting with S, but society is really where your business operates. And the reason it's so important is you rely on happy people working and interacting with your business. So one of the key parts of your business impact is your supply chain, whether you are a service provider or a goods provider, you need to work with people who share your values, who share your goals in terms of ESG. And you can, you know, one of your responsibilities to bring them along the journey with you um, because the crisis that we are facing now can only be solved through collaboration. So having a strong um, supply chain based on collaboration is really the key here. Um, it involves obviously your customer um, and it involves your, your charitable um, actions, but take care of your people, pay them well, and uh, make sure that they feel that they're contributing when they come uh, to work every morning. And the final letter, which is the G for governance, is really the way you, um, you steer your ship. How your, um, what is your article of association? What does it contain? What do you commit to as a business? What is your purpose? How do you translating, translate your purpose into your business practices? And, and, you know, it's about operating ethically, fairly, respectfully, and, and thinking about the common good so that you bring everybody on board. And then finally, to leave you with some thought before I hand over to Sat is what, what do you have as your disposal to start the journey, continue the journey? And you've got, you know, obviously the FSB has got a great sustainability hub. You've got institutions like B Corp or Future Fit Business that provide open source guidelines. You've got various environmental associations that you'd be familiar with that provides good guidelines as well. 
there are plenty of carbon footprint um, tools that are available online your local chamber of commerce or your uh, local enterprise partnership um, organization will be able to support you as well and you've got people like me that are sustainability consultants and and really are here to support businesses to go further on the sustainability effort thank you very much Great, thank you, Muriel. That was that was very interesting. If um, you have any questions for Muriel, um, please post them in the Q and A box, and we'll come back to them at the end of the presentations. Um, also, I should mention that the slides will be shared um, after the event, uh, so you don't have to scribble down all the all the details that our great panel is sharing with you. Um, we're now coming to um, to Sat, um, who is the founder of Circle Up, and our Environment Policy Chair here at the FSB, and he will talk more about the practicalities of ESG and the importance of collaboration. Seth, over to you. Thank you, Frederica. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, so Muriel did a great job in laying down the foundation of what ESG is and, and why it matters. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the how, um, how to go about ESG, and I'll take a particular angle on that. Um, and I've been asked to speak about all things to do with collaboration and cooperation. And I thought this is a good image to show how a group of people are trying to collaborate and competing and cooperating, and yet are probably stuck in a catch-22. Um, this is called a four-way tug of war, um, unlike a two-way tug of war, where there might be a winner or might not. In this case, it's very difficult to win. Now, if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about how I got into this uh, uh, concept of sustainability and how we get different stakeholders to come together to align around sustainable initiatives. Um, and for me, it was an epiphany um, in the desert. A few years ago, um, I was working in the Middle East and uh, at the weekends, a bunch of us would go hiking um, in the midday sun, um, 40 degree plus temperature centigrade. And um, it was crazy, but one of the things I discovered as I was walking along the, the desert um, are the fossils on the ground and, and, and the realization that we were walking along what used to be riverbeds and valleys carved out by water. And so this is clearly a very lush area uh, a few hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago, 10,000s of years ago, and it had become completely desertified and you can see some of the imagery around the fossils that I uh, chanced upon there. And I kind of realized, I, I, I started out as a chemical engineer working in oil refineries, trying to uh, clean up uh, some of what oil refineries do. Uh, and, and the petrochemical industry has a bad press in terms of um, you know, using fossil fuels and pumping out a lot of uh, pollutants and, and ultimately causing um, uh, climate change. However, there are a big uh, uh, group of uh, folks in these industries that are all about cleaning up what they do. So I think we should be fairly balanced on that. I'm not advocating for them, but I'm just saying, let's take a, a balanced approach on, on, on all of this. Um, and what I discovered is that um, if, if this, had ha this had happened to this uh, lush land and it subsequently became uh, essentially a place where oil was discovered. Uh, and that oil, of course, was sedimentation of living things. Uh, so there's actually a sort of a, a cycle of life in there, which is that uh, the folks that used to live there had to become nomadic because there was no water. And eventually hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, tens of thousands of years later, oil was discovered that made this, this area one of the richest in terms of oil wealth um, in the world. And so for me, the question is, well, could that not happen to any other city in the world or any other country in the world? Uh, could it not happen to London, Paris, New York? Um, and yes, and we're accelerating that process because what happened in this region was most likely almost certainly natural, but we're actually accelerating that process um, in not considering what, what our impact on the earth, on the environment. And so if we go to the next slide, um, we talk about, um, so yes, so for me, um, one of the big uh, concepts is about, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. 
if you want to go far, go together. This was a statement uh, uh, delivered by Al Gore, a former US presidential candidate in 2000, and he then subsequently became a, a huge environmental uh, advocate and recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. And he said that this is an African proverb. Um, I'll tell you a little bit later about how, the origin of that. But I thought, okay, so do, do people have to go um, uh, fast or together? Can we not do both? So if you look at that uh, first uh, square bed that says catch 22, i.e. no progress, is it, which is precisely what those four individuals in the four-way tug of war were doing, making no progress, uh, uh, we need to move away from that. We need to have progress. So if we go to the next slide, what we have is when people want to go fast, they usually take, they take from the environment and they take from others. It's all about the individual. It's all about, all about me. If you want to go far, you have to do a little bit of gift. Uh, you have to collaborate. And collaboration is, an, is a hackneyed phrase. A lot of people talk about collaboration as if we haven't been collaborating as a, as a race for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. But the downside of collaboration in the purest sense, it's all about people giving and not getting a lot back. Volunteering is an example of collaboration where you volunteer a lot. We don't really get much back unless you are aligned with the interests of the organization that you're volunteering with. I'm volunteer with the Federation of Small Businesses, for example. Um, so what if we could bring the two together, go fast and go far? And that is about cooperation, give and take. And of course, the, the, the sponsor of the event today is the Corporate Bank. And the more cooperation we have, it, the more benefits we have. We have less cost um, individually and collectively, and therefore more value, and we drive sustainable growth. And so the work we should focus on is around how do we, um, how do we um, work within, between, and across. So within an organization, between organizations, and across industries to cooperate more effectively and align our interests. And there is no greater interest than protecting our environment. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, here are some examples that we can do to, for give and take. And these are taken from the concept of the circular economy, which is all around producing uh, products and services or, or making products and services, delivering products and services that leave minimal footprint on the earth. So the first example, if we go to this next slide, is around uh, producing products as a service, i.e. rather than just creating stuff and selling it, um, create the service and minimize the impact of the product. So this example is from uh, HP, uh, Instant Ink, uh, and essentially you register for a service and they will collect the items uh, from you, the, um, uh, the depleted uh, ink, uh, they collect that from you and they, re they return to you a new cartridge. And so they're focusing on ink as a service, not selling the product of the cartridge. The second one here, uh, circular uh, supply, which is all about supplying products and services that have a, an unlimited source uh, of resource. So for example, recycled paper is based on spent paper, used paper. And as long as we use paper, there'll always be recycle, there'll always be enough paper for recycling. So there's a, a virtuous cycle there, uh, circular economy. If we move to the next one, um, around sharing. So sharing platforms is really important in, in the circular economy. In other words, there are lots of resources that we have, such as uh, cars and in, in the Uber world uh, uh, and the Airbnb world, uh, hotel space or, or space in, within accommodation uh, locations. Uh, but we don't maximize the utility of that. And so there's a lot of waste in terms of uh, the resource that we, ha that we have to hand. So sharing that resource maximizes utility and minimizes waste. So this is an example of, uh, of a sharing platform. There's plenty of others as well. Moving on to the next one, um, product life extension. So this is all about uh, organizations that um, consider the impact on, of their products on the earth and look to minimize it by actually repairing what they're selling. So rather than making a ton of cash by continuing to pump out new products, uh, Patagonia, for example, will take back the uh, items that you bought from them. And mo on most occasions, they will do repairs of the items for free, not on all occasions, but for most occasions. So they're considering the impact of uh, uh, in clothing ending up in landfills and so on and slowing that process down. And then the final one we have is around uh, resource recovery. And this is Ricolite, which is an organization that brought together 
um, the lighting industry, particularly around uh, the uh, recycling of fluorescent tubes and uh, um, LED type lighting. And so what they do is they, they work with the industry to uh, recover the, the valuable resources, the, 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 the metals and um, the gases that are used in this process to make more of the same stuff. So they're actually making uh, more effective use of the resources um, by recovering them in the first place. So those are some of the examples. I think I've gone over on my time, but uh, please fire away, with, fire away with questions. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Great, thank you. Thank you, Seb. These were amazing examples. Um, hopefully they were very helpful for, you, for our audience as well. Um, and also thank you for sharing the personal story at the beginning. Um, as mentioned earlier, please um, feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A box and we'll come to those at the end of the presentations. Um, we are finally coming to uh, Maria and Catherine from the co-op, um, who will be talking about co-op's ESG journey and also how they can help you on your journey. Um, so I think it is Maria first. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning all and, and kind of welcome to today. I'm Maria Kearns, uh, Managing Director of Customer and People at the Bank and delighted to share our ESG story with you and what we've learned along the way. So for many organisations, ESG is a new challenge, but for the bank, it's always been absolutely at the heart of what we do and it's embedded. It's something we've always been committed to and we know that ethics is really the key reason that customers bank with us. Uh, because of the heritage, uh, we're extremely proud to have been rated as the UK's best ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance, rated High Street Bank from Sustainalytics. So it was a real testament to the way in which we do business. And as an organisation, we are absolutely committed to protecting the environment, um, to making a positive difference. And, and we're celebrating that in our 150 year anniversary. Um, we, we have been doing this and committed to cooperative values for all those years. So on our journey, we focus very specifically on building a greener future for young people, uh, for cooperation for the nation, including all the support to our cooperative sector and also inspiring others by you know, really delivering a, a target driven sustainability strategy uh, that tries to take some really bold steps. Uh, so the next slide that we're on now just talks us through the ESG journey. You'll see in the slide some of the achievements and commitments that we've made across the key areas of ESG and some of these you know you may wish to consider for your own business. Uh, environmental we've got a really strong set of commitments and um, you know we have been actively acting as if there's been a climate crisis uh, for at least the last 30 years. So we've been beyond carbon neutral since 2007. We're committed to continuously reducing that. We're a net zero bank uh, for scope one and two. Uh, and actually we intend to report on our scope three later on this year. We've got 100% of our electricity purchased by renewables. Uh, we've achieved zero waste to landfill uh, already for the last two years. And we're aiming to be recycling 60% of all of the operational waste by the end of 2022. To, to create that circular economy that we've heard about so far. We've got lots of you know, key things, no plastic in our debit cards, uh, fully recyclable paper, no chemicals in any of our inks. And, and fundamentally, we have and always will refuse to provide banking services to any business or organisation that doesn't meet with our ethical requirements. So anybody who has anything to do with the extraction and production of fossil fuels, we will not bank with. Uh, we've done that for 30 years. And it also includes of course, companies that fail to uphold human rights, who take an irresponsible approach to paying tax or involved in gambling, things that you know you wouldn't want to be involved with, we aren't either. Um, and finally, we're trying to lead the way on some of these things. You know, we're signatories of the UN Principles for Responsible Banking, the first bank to sign the you know, Paris Pledge. And we're trying to lead the kind of political campaigns around the CEE bill, the Climate and Ecological Bill, and, and their kind of zero hour campaign. Um, and then from a social perspective, which is the kind of middle box, we, you know, we really do believe in cooperation. It's the business model that our, our forefathers have kind of gifted to us. And it's quite an exciting time. So the cooperative economy is 38 billion. So we are a, a growing group in the UK economy. Um, to support our social ambitions, you know, we've raised uh, two million pounds 
sense points, tackle homelessness, youth homelessness since 2017. We've donated 1.3 million through our Everyday Rewards product. Uh, we're big supporters of the cooperative, as you would expect. Uh, we've invested 2.1 into new cooperative businesses. Uh, we've got a customer donation fund uh, since 2003 to help support charities and community customers. Um, and we're all about driving you know, meaningful social change. So we work with national partners and we work with them for decades. Um, I think we've worked with Amnesty and Refuge for, you know, for, for 30 and 40 years. And we've created some really meaningful campaigns with them. You know, with Refuge, we lead on um, the economic abuse campaign, My Money, My Life. Um, and it's actually transformed the way in which the entire banking industry deals with those vulnerable customers. Um, we're dedicated to working with Amnesty. Uh, we've recently launched our DEC campaign for the Ukraine, and it's raised over £425,000. We were the, the largest uh, kind of corporate donor for Just Giving. And, and we support charities that are also close to customers' hearts. Um, and I think having that kind of real social connection makes a massive difference to how colleagues can feel involved and engaged with ESG. And then finally, onto governance. Obviously, we do our annual sustainability reports. Uh, for us, we report that on the same day as our financial reports, because for us, it is as important. Um, and we're making some bold statements. So from this year, all of our executive pay is linked to our ESG performance targets. We're first, first and only bank to do that. And um, we're also signed up to, obviously, Women in Finance Pledge. Um, we're an accredited disability confident employer um, and, and we've a living wage employer and we've got a kind of values and ethics committee that pulls everything together. So I think the key part is making sure that it's really thought through across the entire organisation. Um, so what you could do in your business. So these are a few ideas for you. So, you know, you could consider creating your own ESG or ethical policy. Um, we've created a template that you can use after the session. It's a really useful tool that helps you kind of define what those commitments can be and where to begin. So I think firstly, you need to speak to customers and colleagues and suppliers and find out what it is that they want you to do. You know, it's really important. One of the things that I feel very proud about is that I can kind of hand on heart say, I'm doing the right thing for, you know, the environment, the economy, uh, vulnerable people in society, but I'm doing it because customers are telling me to. So I think having that kind of really clear customer mandate is really important. Um, you know, do share your ideas through social media. Uh, we've got a kind of hashtag, uh, our ethical policy, so we can all share our pledges. You know, collectively, we will stand in a better position. Um, and then on to my uh, final slide on how to implement an ESG strategy. Uh, the last slide, it just covers how you can implement the strategy with some things to think about. So first of all, look at what you do now. What elements within your business already support it? You probably find there's lots of things that you might already do can you clearly articulate it um could you make it clearer could you refine it could you strengthen it I, I always take the view no matter how complex or big your business is if you can't explain it to the person you meet at the bus stop then it's probably too complicated secondly where do you want to be in the short medium and long term how can you weave esg through your business how can you really set some clear objectives if you measure it you tend to do it so what measurements have you got and where do you expect to be um you know there are lots of resources that can help you with this or, or you can create your own you know whatever works best for your business and finally you know really do your research make sure you look into your supplier base make sure you understand exactly what it is that you want to achieve achieve and collaborate you know speak to your staff speak to your suppliers and networks business relationships work out how you can do things collectively you know all of this is around doing that so, so we can look back on our careers and feel that we made the right choices not just commercial choices for our businesses but that actually we, we left the environment we operated in better than we came into it so you know really think about how you can weave that through through your performance management through your hr policies make sure it forms part of every aspect of your business and then implement. So consider setting up focus group networks, task forces internally or externally, you know, really drive the ESG agenda. Um, and to do that it needs a bit of thought, but it really needs energy and positivity and people who are passionate about making a difference. Um, and I'll leave you with my final piece of advice, which is that it's really important to empower colleagues to make a difference on this. So, you know, what, what we find is, I'm actually so heavily challenged by our colleague base who believe we can be better, we can do more things, we can do different things. And actually, once you've created that kind of group or army of advocates who really want to make a difference in, in, in the world they operate in, there's, there's really no stopping you. Uh, Catherine, over to you. That's great. Thanks very much, Maria. So I just really want to sort of talk about following on from what 
what Marie has been talking around, around sustainable financial decisions. And I think, you know, at the Cooperative Bank, you know, we, we also take this really seriously. So, you know, we do all ethical screening for every business application that we do. We make sure that suppliers really do live our values and ethics as well. And that any third party we work for uh, in terms of product advice, again, you know, they go through the ethical screening and need to um, sort of fit our um, values and ethics as well and if we're making any investments um, you know as a brand we need to make sure that we've done our due diligence to make sure that our investment is being used in the right way so we really do want to help small businesses make sustainable financial decisions and where small businesses and individuals choose to bank and invest their money significantly influences their social impact and carbon f- footprint as well and this has got to be a key consideration for any ESG strategy We've done some recent research and actually that showed us that over a third of UK adults would consider switching to a banking provider with stronger credentials and social issues. But actually, despite that, only 15 percent of those adults actually know what their banking providers ESG rating actually is. So, you know, what is sustainable finance? Well, the economy plays a pivotal role in society and therefore financial decisions need to consider the impact on society and the environment. And these must align with commercial needs and goals. And as Maria states, it's around, you know, making our environment and and the world a stronger place to, to be when we actually leave it. So just on my last slide as well, we've just detailed some types of sustainable finance, and these sort of include sustainable investment funds. So these are investments that put money towards projects that uphold ethics and values, green and social bonds, social venture capital. So this is investment in companies whose purpose is to solve social and environmental issues. And then green loans. So this is to finance the purchase of efficient domestic appliances, equipment, machinery, low emission vehicles, and other eco-friendly items. So just maybe some areas that you might just want to consider as a small business. So really start to, you know, challenge your own financial decisions. Um, think about if, you know, they are sustainable, if they're the right decisions for you to make. Explore some of those um, sustainable financial options that I've talked about there. And actually, we can actually offer lending uh, solutions for the implementation of renewable energy technologies and improvements. And we're really key to support um, businesses in this area. And it is actually one of our key focuses um, for this year and beyond as well. So please do, you know, come and talk to us at the Cooperative Bank. And then really start to ask questions, interrogate. So, you know, the financial institutions you actually work with now, what are they actually doing? with your money and do you feel comfortable with that do they meet your personal values and ethics and your personal ambitions um, around ESG as well that's everything from me so thanks very much I'll hand back over wonderful thank you so much to both of you Maria and Kevin that was very very interesting um, and thank you so much for sharing um, you know your journey and also very 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 helpful um, tips of what businesses can do I'll be, I'll stop sharing the presentation and this also concludes the first half of our webinar. So we will open now um, the floor for questions and a couple of questions have already come in. Um, I know that our panels have been typing away. Um, in the meantime as well, I've asked, answered a few questions. So feel free to pop in more into the Q and, uh, Q&A box and we'll start with the first question. Um, so we have one for Sat here. Um, are there any gaps? Uh, are there any gap analysis tools available for small business owners? Hi, and I forget who the question was from, but um, it was Neil. Oh, sorry, I Neil. should have said that. Yes, Neil. Okay, Neil. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't think there's enough out there, and if, and of those that are out there, they're not necessarily uh, standardized, and so it gets a little bit confusing. I think the best way for SMEs to get involved in this and make the changes that are needed to work with um, uh, organizations, many, many of them government funded, uh, that are actually um, hand-holding um, SMEs through the process. Uh, and it, as part of that, they have some templates and uh, techniques to do some base lighting, some uh, um, um, uh, c- comparison tools that, as, you, as you asked about. So some examples, B Corp is one, that's a, a global organization with chapters across the, the, the world, including the UK. Um, um, Muriel mentioned in passing, and basically with B Corp, you go through a process of accreditation to ensure that you are uh, fulfilling uh, lots of the ESG credentials, 
uh, and it's not just E, it is S as well as G. Um, so B Corp is one thing you might want to explore. Uh, there are other organizations, and there's one focus in the UK called the Good Business Charter, again, focusing more on the S and the G. Um, Better Futures, uh, this is a London-based organization. They're focused on E, uh, mainly on E. So they, they have a process of uh, cohorts of SMEs that go through programs to get more aware of climate change and the impact that they have and what they can do to measure uh, their carbon footprint and make changes. Uh, Re-London, which is a partnership with the Mayor of London. Uh, I know this sounds all very London focused, so I apologize. I'm sure there are more regional ones as well. Um, the Re-London focus on the circular economy and how SMEs can uh, be more proactive in transitioning to the circular economy. So hopefully those are some examples. I'm sure uh, the others may have some examples as well. Um, yes, Muriel, do you have anything else you would like to add maybe? Or is the list from earlier, is that, does that cover everything? Uh, nothing ever covers everything. Let's be mm -hmm. humble. Um, no, I think SAP did a, a very good job. They, they are um, uh, over 200 um, organizations that um, offer some kind of template uh, standard or any of the above um, when it regards to any of the letters. I can only encourage people to um, look at frameworks that offer a 360 approach that includes the three letters, because I think that's the only way that you end up not creating a problem when you're trying to solve one. So um, yeah, um, all high value in any organization that focuses on environment. However, people concentrate on the S and the G as well. Thank you. Um, speaking of, of the of the G, we have a question from Sylvia who um, who says that um, she feels governance is lost in ESG, and um, would you be able to advise what more can be done to ensure good governance? First of all, it starts with the articles of association. So, what do you want to um, your sorry? What do you want your business to stand for? What is your purpose? Document it in your articles of association, um, because at the end of the day, this is what you refer mm -hmm. to when things are going, you know, um, things are tough. Then you go back to your article of association, where it's documented what you st uh, stand for, and and going back to to B Corp as Sat mentioned, B Corp asks you to to modify um, your articles and and to ensure that in there you've got your commitments to positively impact. Um, environment and, and society. So I would start with that. But it also goes to how you select your board, um, how you measure your impact, how transparent you are in the way you generate your profit, how transparent you are about how you um, share your profit. And it's about being uh, an, an advocate um, of, of these two towards you know, all your stakeholders. But at the end of the day, measure your impact, um, set yourselves high uh, targets and develop the processes and the management system that helps you to achieve that. That's how I would um, I would answer that question. Great, thank you. Um, one for a set, I believe. Um, so the for in, including Mural again. So the first two presentation um, shared key points about ESG and obviously highlighted why it matters. That's a question from Veronica. Um, so thank you for posting this. Um, so she's concerned that no mention was made about the importance of boards, including NEDs, having relevant skills and expertise to ensure the informed decision making and de-risking and strategic plans. Um, she's very keen to hear uh, your view on the need of, uh, for rethinking expertise, knowledge necessary on boards, as well as the management teams. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Point, actually, I think there is a lack of um, awareness um, at uh, uh, board levels, at, at NED levels. It's changing fast because the environment, um, not the physical environment, but the regulatory environment is changing. Um, and there needs to be more um, awareness and education within boards and NEDs of their fiduciary responsibilities um, on um, governing the organization they're, they're, they're looking after. Um, there are organizations like my, my, my own organization that facilitates that process. Um, I think there's a need for more of those kinds of organizations. Um, there is too much going on too fast for everybody to really understand it. 
Uh, and so the more we can get to a, a, play, a, a level of standardization and simplicity for all to understand, that would be uh, the ideal scenario. And, and some of us are working towards that. So it was a great question. I think um, more needs to be done in that space. Um, great, thank you very much. Um, is there, if um, Mural, you don't wanna add anything to this, I think there's a question or specific for you. Um, it's from a um, one of our anonymous attendees um, and um, he or she is asking, um, if you are one person business that works from home, how much difference can you make environmentally apart from obviously using less energy or making your home as efficient as you can? Thank you, Frederick. If I, if I may add to what Sat said, I think that the, um, the training, education on you know, the board members, making sure that you know, people are um, yeah, educated on what it means to ESG at a board level and how to support the businesses um, that they, 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 they sit on the, the best they can, I think is, is fundamental and there are many around. Um, in terms of being a sole trader and you know, how you can influence, well, you have a voice. You have a voice, use it. Talk about it. Um, and that's, I think, your your greatest impact beyond, um, you know, walking the talk. You know, making sure you only heat your office in the house as opposed to the entire house during the day. Making sure that you support your local charities, that you give your time, that you offer your services for free to charities and other businesses that are don't have the the means to uh, to pay you uh, for them. And um, there's many many uh, ways to to just be a good a good responsible citizen that would uh, make a big difference um to to the s for sure environment is about you mostly your energy consumption you know what do you drive how often do you drive how far do you drive etc so i strongly believe in the impact of individuals um, and remember as a business owner your your um, impact is much greater because you work with others. That's where your impact is. Um, great. Um, maybe for Maria and Catherine as well, is that come up in conversation with um, with uh, um, with clients um, that you're talking to at, at the bank? Um, just you know, the question of what can I do if I'm if I'm working from home? Um, has has there been a conversation? Maybe do you have any advice for them? Yeah, of course, and it, and it has come up as a question, um, not just from from our kind of business, uh, you know, sm smaller kind of one, one man businesses, but also um, from our colleagues. So colleagues are saying actually they're, they're working from home much more, and what can they do to make a difference? Um, and actually, we're working with an energy coach, so you know, big businesses are are suffering from um, the same you know hikes in energy prices as all individuals are and actually you know there's, there's lots of things that, that probably we, we should have done beforehand that make us more efficient that make sure that we're really thinking through our usage and how we use it and what we can do differently um so so we've got a kind of set of materials that we're working through with an energy coach which we're sharing with all our colleagues uh, and actually we can make that available for for our customers as well to just give them kind of hints and tips about you know very practical things you can do that that uh, can make a difference specifically in relation to uh, energy uh, and energy usage but I agree wholeheartedly with with everything that uh, Muriel has said that actually there's a, there's a wider impact that you can have um, and I think it's more around w understanding exactly what it is you want your business to be known for particularly around the ESG and then working out how you can very specifically help with that um, so so we found particular things within our business where you know we, we can make a real difference with the way the entire banking industry supports a group of customers um, and actually if you can work out where you can make a difference with the service that you offer to your suppliers then, then what can that be how can you kind of implement that how can you turn that into something um, so yeah very happy to help and, and share that information wonderful thank you that's very helpful um there is there have been two questions on rating esg rating i'm not sure whether you can also comment on that so there's one question about is there a standard rating if not is that not why customers don't value ESG as it's not comparable and then the second one from Phyllis who decides a company's ESG rating 
Yeah, and, and both absolutely brilliant questions. So, you know, ESG, um, we would say, you know, we, we focus on the corporative values and ethics because cooperation is key to us. And ESG sits as part of that. So, of course, it forms part of our values and ethics strategy. Um, so, so for us, we're quite long in the tooth on this. This is kind of part of what we've been doing for a really long time. But for most businesses, this is quite new. So, you know, considerations of how they will respond to it is, is relatively immature. Uh, so equally, the kind of, you know, for, for financial businesses, things like Moody's and Fitch and those rating agencies are very established. It's very clear how they give you a rating and what you need to do and how you can improve. With ESG, this is slightly, um, slightly newer. So there are lots of organisations. Um, there's Sustain Analytics, which give you uh, a kind of very clear and independent ESG rating. Um, there's MSCI that provide ratings for it. And um, there's S&P. So there's lots of different organisations that provide you with an independent scoring so you provide evidence as to how you meet um, the ESG requirements within your business and they will give you a score and that score will be based on whether or not your impact is negligible it's, it's an interesting one in ESG you want to be negligible it's not many places where you want to have a negligible impact but ESG is one of them and it places you on that plateau of the impact that your business makes um, so we have our sustainability uh, rating which we're really proud about because it's kind of put us as this number one positioning um, but actually you know that that they are the metrics that, that all banks will start really chasing towards and businesses will start chasing towards. And that can only be for the benefit of everybody. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Um, I have a, another question. Um, I'm, I'm opening up for the panel. Um, so whoever feels like it's the first one wants to answer it. Um, so obviously, um, given so it's a question from Robert so given that we tend to hit the goals we focus on what do panelists think about having a collective focus on becoming net positive versus net zero or any other incremental step between where we are today and a fully net positive world um, maybe Merle if you would like to kick off and then maybe the other ones wants to chip in as well I'll, I'll start by saying that net positive is also on my bedside table um, and it's a really good um, book to to read if um, anybody is that way inclined by um, Andrew Wilson and um, sorry Paul Polman gosh the guy is a celeb and I forgot his name anyway um, absolutely Robert and and the the challenge in those webinars is you've got very limited time to say everything that matters um, so that's what I was trying to say about regeneration. We need to regenerate uh, the environment and, and society alike. And if I put the emphasis on, on society, you know, one of the key activities that is are being driven uh, for the moment mm -hmm. by um, responsible businesses is the, um, the living wage payment, making sure that uh, people are paid enough, not only to have a shelter and food on the table, but to pay for education um, of the kids, for example. So, so that, for me, contributes to net positive. But I, I leave the floor to, to the other panelists to, to contribute as well. Like you said, do you have a, another thought about this or maybe from the co-op bank um because you're obviously very um you're very committed to the to the agenda and have been for the past few decades if not we can oh sorry you're coming in sorry hi Frederick. <laughs> is this a is a question on net positive and net zero yeah yeah and any other incremental step between where we are today and a fully positive net world I think we are all at the very early stages. Um, as much as this is making a lot of news, um, there's a long way to go um, and it's gonna be incremental. Uh, and I think it starts, as everyone has said so far, around measuring where we are now as an organization, each individual organization, and then taking baby steps towards the goal. Um, it's not gonna happen that quickly, uh, but as soon as all others are doing this, there's gonna be a group effect and that's going to give us a lot more momentum. So I kept that really simple, but hopefully that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, and we have one from Sarah who asks, um, how can small organisations go about measuring their ESG performance? Um, any suggestion where to start from? Maybe, again, uh, Catherine or Maria, um, any, any recommendations? 
Yeah, more than happy to come in here. So actually, we work and, and partner with a company called Zella, which is Z-E-L-L-A-R. And actually, what Zella is about, this is a, st- a sustainability platform to help small businesses understand mm-hmm. what their ESG rating sort of could be right now, and also gives them very practical advice on how they can improve across all three elements of uh, ESG as well. So I'd highly recommend it. Uh, we're happy to sort of share any of those details too. It's, it's a fairly new tool to the market. Market and a new platform to the market but I think um, the more people that actually take the benefit of using it then we get more information from right across the different sectors as well and then we can start to share some sort of best in class actions that uh, you know small businesses are taking and provide some of those um, business case studies as well which I think was another question from uh, from a gentleman um, actually as part of one of the questions that was posed to us as well so but more than happy as I say to provide any further detail on that so anybody that might like to see it. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I guess there was one last question if we have about five more minutes. Um, <clears throat> um, so it's from a question from Lawrence. Uh, I'm in the process of starting a business that will um, do all the companies. Um, sorry. One second, <laughs> just rereading the question. I'm in the process, so it's it's Lawrence. Um, so I'm in the process of starting a business that will audit companies who will use process cooling in data centers. They will be able to report to voluntary the voluntary participation of the scheme in their environmental, social, and government reports and use the logo on their packaging to gain customer trust and show compliance. Um, his question now is, do we rely too much on people reporting and who's checking those? Do we have any volunteers from the panel? Yeah, so so voluntary participation. Um, I I guess it's about those who are at the forefront, who are the pioneers, who are the game changers, whether you're a SME or a large organization will move first and they will volunteer and do something about it and voluntarily report. Um, others will be laggards and will be slow to change, uh, but there's going to be a pivoting point, the, you know, a, a point, uh, a tipping point where more organizations quickly follow the lead. So I, I think it's really whether the organization, SME, SME or otherwise, feel that they need to report just to indicate they are net zero or ESG compliant, whatever that means for them. Um, and, and those leaders make the change and hopefully more people will see that and follow the leader. Great, thank you. Um, I don't um, believe we have any further questions. Oh, oh Maria, to... oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to dwell on that and say that, um, that the one thing we've all got to be very, very careful about um, is, you know, new terminology comes along in industries and people respond to it in the best way they can. The challenge with ESG is we end up with lots of organisations desperately trying to respond to something, but it actually doesn't have the output that it's supposed to. So I think the key around reporting is what is the outcome of what you're doing? And I think that's that's the really important point. You know, we, we need to make sure that um, big and large businesses don't you know, work towards that kind of greenwashing where the, the, the kind of overall view looks as though we are taking steps that make a difference because this is important. This is a kind of, you know, a moral imperative that we do something to protect the world in which we live. So, so you have to make sure that what you're committing to has a genuine and um, changing outcome. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And it is important to be committed to your goals and um, probably also then encourage other organizations and your business partners, supply chain and customers to, to do the same. Um, I believe this concludes today's webinar. If there are no further questions, you can always reach out to um, your local DM. Obviously, you can reach out to us. Um, I'm, I'm sure that Muriel, Sat, and also Mira and Catherine are more than happy to continue the conversation because it's a, such a vital agenda. Um, so we'll um, conclude today's uh, webinar, but before I'll say my final words, um, just to um, remind you that the slides will be shared after the uh, after the webinar and the webinar, the recording of the webinar will also be available on the FSB website, and I'm sure um, also on Co-op's um, platform as well as Merrill and um, Sat's website. 
Um, one final um, note from, from co-op, um, the template that was mentioned earlier in the presentation, we are also more than happy to share that with everybody who attended today's webinar. And um, please feel free to share um, the steps you're taking or thinking about taking um, so we can, you know, all be encouraged um, by, by this important um, issue. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us today. It was, um, I hope you enjoyed the webinar as much as I have. I've learned a lot today. Um, if you enjoyed today's event, uh, also please do leave us a trust pilot review. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, we will um, keep you posted on future events on, um, on sustainability and other very important matters and um, hope to see you soon again.